Welcome to Three, a show about Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic. I'm Gil Gross, host of Monday Match Analysis with two outstanding tennis journalists, Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. And this is the first episode of our show where, although it's a show about the big three, we're going to talk about a guy who was considered to be in the big four, right? There, there were some years there where you would call it a big four, correct? Yeah, there were some, well... <laughs> Never, never, no, Amy. Never in Amy's mind. Never. Look at Amy. Never. Well, I mean, you, you, you of all people, Joel, you've got to have historical perspective. I mean, Boris Becker won six. Andy's won three. It, it just, I know we're talking about current, but as time goes on, you realize that Andy, while an amazing human being who does these really cool things and has a mom who's like a superstar, talk about the big three of moms is Judy Murray. But um, you realize the separation and that Andy is just going to go down probably as a great player. Oh, no, he won't be, he, it won't be the big four now. But you go back to the middle of the journey, you go back to 2012. Murray beats Novak in the U.S. Open final, wins his first major. You go back to 2013, Murray beats Novak in the Wimbledon final. Murray is making a statement for it becoming the, the big four, and, he, and, it's, and it's being discussed as a, as a notional concept. And then what happens is the other three each felt him a little bit in their tail, and they just kind of got yet better. I think, I think Novak most of all, because there was, there was a moment there 2012, 13, you know, we were starting to see some of the physical challenges that Nadal was facing. Federer um, from 2012 to 2017 didn't win a major. So we're starting to, no, Murray finished the year number one in 2016. So there, there were statements Murray made in 12, 13, 16 that might this be the big four, but I think when you look at it now from, from relief, from this vantage point, you see, you know, it's kind of funny. Not quite as inventive as Federer, though Murray has an inventive quality to him. Not quite, certainly not as physical as Nadal, and not quite as kind of dialed in as Novak. I watched the, uh, I was there when Novak beat Murray in the French Open final in 2016 on the court. And you could see Murray has a broader set of imaginative tools. I mean, to get back to our platform, maybe about playing the game, Murray's got some interesting little tricks in his bag that Novak, he's a great volleyer. He's, he's got a lot of neat things. However, his core competencies aren't as good as Novak. So if Novak, it, it reminds me a little bit of when history, Bjorn Borg, Guillermo Vilas. And Vilas had some shot making, some lefty things, some spark. And Murray shows some of that too. But when you get back to the core blocking and tackling, and Novak, he ended up just kind of, you know, he, he, again, you, you just really can't do enough to praise the way Novak Djokovic has continued to kind of invest in his R&D and improve and doing it amid the two Titans in Federer Nadal, as well as the, um, as well as the, the, you know, Murray, who's really, really good. Oh, he's but, so, I mean, I'll probably get skewed, skewered for this, but he's so smart. And of the four, he's probably the smartest. You mean, um, you mean, you mean smart is smart for what smart for He's quick, you know, quick in the head on the court, um, off the court. He figures out a way to win. He outthinks his opponents. Um, he just has an incredible command out there. Uh, hey, you know, off the court, he would never do something like, Novak just did you know he's just too socially aware um but sometimes it's better not to have all that I think and um he, as aware as Murray was of everything going on on the court he was also probably aware of the skills that he didn't have so I would call him a very smart um almost overachiever um, and yet, at the same time, he still can't hang with the three. Well, actually, I got one for you, Amy. You covered the Atlanta Braves, a great baseball team in their heyday, and they had a tremendous pitching staff. And so, in a way, is Murray kind of like the, a fantastic third starter? You know, it's like a baseball team. Sometimes a, a, pitching, a pitching rotation has one or two guys who are just kind of like they are the aces, you know, like way back. This is long before – this is even before I was born. 
the Dodgers had Koufax and Drysdale, and they were winning 20, 22 games a year plus. But then there's that that third starter who uh, – Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's it, in the Braves rotation, you had Smoltz and Glavin and Maddox, and then they always had that amazing fourth starter like Avery. Um, maybe he's the Avery, but the difference is that um, – Murray will be a Hall of Famer. <laughs> well, they're different yeah. sports, but he's he's. But in a way, Murray, you know, the, the history of tennis has this. Uh, Vitas Carolitis at one point was only the only people better than him were Connors, Jimmy Connors, Bjorn Borg, and John McEnroe. And so Vitas is kind of like the best of the rest. And I think what we will say, what history will tell us, and I'll wrestle someone to the ground, a standard rinker friend to the ground of this, is there's no question in the Federer, Nadal, Djokovic era, the guy closest to them, better than all the others was Andy Murray, more than That's Stan it. Uh, I think I think you hit the nail on the head because what Murray had in common with Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic is he beat everyone else. I never got the sense in the first round of a major and the second round of a major that Murray was more likely to get upset by, you know, world number 50 through 120 when compared with the other three. Murray beat everyone else with incredible consistency. And he beat the other three at majors. He beat all, he has mm-hmm. wins over every one of those guys at majors. So but losing overall head to heads to well, all three. Federer, head head. it's close. Yeah, Federer, it's close, but he's, but, but well, and that gets into matchups and certain kind of things. And I think you got him and him and uh, him and uh, Novak, you know, they're peers that are born a week apart. And, and you've got Novak who says pretty much with everything you can do, I can kind of do better, particularly in the core Round stroke ways. I mean, when I watch that mm-hmm. French final, seeing the play, you see a lot of the points go the same way. A lot of the points, yes, a lot of cross court down the line, a lot of grinding. Would you say that I always take the Djokovic forehand over the Murray forehand with a fair yeah. bit of distance? And I think that's major because, Joel, you've talked about Murray's inventiveness and his, his feel for the geometry of the court. I agree with you. He, he really does do very clever things to create offense. But the fact that he has to resort to that is a bit of a burden for him. I don't think he has the same kind of weaponry off the ground that the other three do. No, that's exactly right. The back, backhand, backhand, pretty, pretty darn good. But again, yes. the forehand, and again, like a, like a teacher told me, he had a choice between a, a big forehand and a big backhand, take the big forehand. And, and Novak, while his forehand is as big as Federer and Nadal, but you see the work Novak has put to make it better. And the way he used it, there's a, there's a physicality to Novak which, that he's added to his form. And Murray, he had some technical and mental limitations, some things he doesn't – it's technically something he can't do. You know, and Judy Murray told me an interesting thing once. Growing up in Scotland, there weren't as many technical teachers. So a lot of Judy Murray's instruction and tennis education was filtered through tactics. Judy Murray told me once three things she tells everyone. She works with everyone, and that includes 10-year-olds. She says, make trouble avoid trouble, get out of trouble. And you could see from a very early age, Andy Murray had this tactical mind, the gears clicking, like, how do I make this guy do what he doesn't want to do? I mean, that's why I think, Amy, I brought up the third and you brought up the fourth starter. Like the guy, yeah, I don't quite have the fastball. I may not even have the slider. So I got to just, and it's not a junk ball pitcher, but it's like, I got to just be a little more versatile here. Yeah, I mean, he's the one who lobs and, you know, drop shots and, you know, hits the overhead and um, clever. That's a good way to describe him. But there's also a, a brute athleticism. And, and I think, Joel, you correctly pointed out he's not, he, he's not as physical as Nadal because nobody is. But I've always appreciated Andy Murray's willingness to suffer. And that which is really a Nadal idiom, but I think it applies to Murray as well. Murray in Spain, remember, Murray took time to grow his game. He's also, he's also six foot three. You know, he's not, he's mm-hmm. not, he's not, shrimp. He's, not he's not David Ferrer, but, but we don't, I don't think of him as playing like big, like Nadal. You see Nadal on TV, you see Nadal in person, it's like this guy, this guy will run you right over. Right. Uh, so the willingness to suffer combined with his incredible consistency. I mean, anytime Murray made an unforced error, you kind of flinched because it was, it was so rare. That is an incredibly powerful combination against everyone on tour. And I, I think the big three, they just had that plus more. And that was the big issue for, for Andy. But uh, I think, you know, I think 
that's that's interesting that you mentioned Spain because Murray, you know, came along in this this era of tennis where you know the rallies got longer and they got tougher, and he was really up to the test. And but Gil, you're it. talking about him like he's in the past. He had, he had. Do you know something we don't yeah. know? No, <laughs> yeah, you're right, you're right. No, well, remember look, a year and a half ago, Murray thought he was going. Remember, Murray, he I said, I, I retired. I was at that match in Australia where it was thought that it was yeah. going to be his last match. And then he had the surgery and, and speaking, talk about suffering. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Did, do, did you guys see the documentary that he did? Uh, what was it that. called? It was on Amazon. I haven't it seen was, it yet. Okay. Yes. It, it's on Amazon Prime. It is, uh, it is a documentary about Andy Murray's recovery from uh, hip surgery. And yeah, a lot of suffering. Can confirm a lot of suffering in that. I one. got something that's interesting on Murray. You know, it's funny. Murray's the one who most arrived with what I'll call the the cultural agenda, because the British hope, the Fred Perry droughts, all the hopes of a nation. And I remember God, and I know working how many things I've written in television and in print about the the possibility of Andy Murray at least achieving the breakthroughs. So he had a lot of external cultural baggage attached to him, and yet now, now that the mission is accomplished, he has compared to the other three far less of that around him, you know, it's pretty much business with Andy Murray. I don't mean he's business, like I just mean it's pretty much the tennis and his life. You know, he doesn't, you know, like, like, um, like you said, he doesn't commit faux pas around, you know, get himself into trouble around certain statements or things. He's not, he, he's not, you know, he doesn't have the halo worldwide that someone like Federer has. You know, it's fun. He's just, there's a certain no nonsense quality to him that's very appealing. Yeah, I think the documentary is called Resurfacing. It was the double entendre with mm -hmm. the hip. So he may resurface, you know, after all this. He may, um, I know he had some injury recently, but he may, you know, come back and win a slam, surprise us all. The fact that he won Antwerp last uh, fall right. was incredibly impressive. I mean, that was an effort, yeah. Yeah, he beat, he beat Vavrinka in, in that tournament if my memory serves me, and, and he looked really good. So it will be interesting to see if, if Andy Murray writes an, a new chapter, which is, is filled with success. He's talked about someone. He has a new perspective on, on you know, who he is as an athlete because I, I think he said, look, I, I took a lot of stuff for granted. I traveled the world, and I never took the time to appreciate what my life is until I had to step away. Well, we'll see how many museum trips these guys make now that they have this new perspective and how many cafes and uh, youth hostels they stay at, too. Regarding the pandemic, though, just back to the big three, it's interesting to me that each of the three of them had a different um, sort of experience and take on this whole thing. First, you had Federer, who really didn't need to do anything or say anything outrageous or opinionated because he was injured. So it was kind of a non-starter. Then you had Nadal who was the very like, everyone socially distanced, let's take this seriously. I don't think, I may not play the US Open, at least that's what Uncle Tony says because I'm worried. And then you had Djokovic who wasn't worried at all. It was just sort of like, let it. So it's interesting to me that the three of them had a completely different take throughout this whole thing. Tennis, it's great, man. That's one of the great things about the sport. I mean, it's so funny. I guess every endeavor has its, has its strength and weakness all in once. And one of the things I think I know I love about tennis is this whole capacity for self-expression, individualism. You know, this is a sport like uh, you, you play tennis so you don't have someone telling you what to do. So there you are. You get to just kind of, and, and think of the, the singularity and the self-reliance that builds even in you know, civilians like us. And then you ramp that up exponentially times 10 times 10 and you're on the top of the world. I mean, it's a pretty interesting sense of, of ego development. And I mean that in a healthy way, but it, it has some interesting, interesting views of things. I mean, even LeBron need, needs four other people to pass in the ball. Well, well I think this is, a, this is a great place to end it because we've talked about how, yeah, it, it's a big three, it's not a big four, but that fourth guy was pretty darn good. I think one thing we can all agree on though, is that when it comes to off the court contributions, it might as well be a big four, because Andy Murray has been on the money on, on social issues, and you know he's also just got a really positive personality and a great sense of humor. And 
Uh, I'm sure both of you will have thoughts on this, but to me, Andy Murray off the court, he's, he's right up there. Oh, he's tremendous. With, he's tremendous with these things. I'm not going to put those other three just because they've accomplished more and have, can more easily garner a platform. I'm not going to, I'm not going to create a big anything around tennis players and their philanthropic, you know what I mean? There are things, of course. There, there are a great many things for all we know that tennis players do that we might not even know about. So I don't want to just, and, you know, we, and we haven't talked about people like uh, Madison Keys and Coco Goff and numerous, uh, some recent things, Naomi Osaka, many ways, many ways tennis players can use their platform in ways this pandemic is maybe shifting it. And we'll see coming out of the pandemic how that works, but that's a, uh, that's a fascinating topic. That's our first episode, and we hope that you rate and review. We know it's early um, and that we're only one in. But if you liked what you heard, leave us a rating. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe on wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe on YouTube. We'll be on YouTube and we'll be on audio platforms. And we can't, can't wait to bring you more three 